Welcome to the information for the Rudder Cup, one of the world's, it's actually the third longest running yacht race in the world. The uh, ORCV is very proud of the Rudder Cup. It's um, one of those races that's just perfect for early entry ocean races. So it's a natural progression from our Triple SC course and when a skipper feels that uh, the yacht is seaworthy and at cap two, and we're going to talk a lot about CAT2 and compliance and safety throughout the briefing because it's a big component of actually um, entering the Rudder Cup. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about all the positive things because there's a lot of great aspects to, to this particular race. It, um, I've actually sailed Bass Strait when it's been like a paddock with beautiful, gentle rolling fields and sun shining and we've only tacked about three times from Melbourne all the way to uh, Mercy Yacht Club. It can be, in fact, uh, last year quite a lot of the sailors did it in shorts, which is uh, quite a rarity for Bass Strait. You can see whales, dolphins, seals, um, all sorts of bird life and, of course, fish. If you're lucky enough, you can catch some uh, phosphorescence happening. But the glorious uh, sunsets and spectacular scenery, and it's a lot of fun. It can be a low-stress race if you've got good weather. Uh, of course, there's the other side of it where it can be really, really crappy with lots of uh, wind, rough seas. It can be wet, cold, and like all ocean racing, it can be uncomfortable. And, of course, seasickness is something that... Um, the majority of sailors have to manage at one point or another and um, fortunately the watch system, uh, generally speaking, the race goes for around about 18 to 22 hours, 24 hours depending on your your boat and your handicap, etc. But uh, the, the watches can't be too, aren't too onerous in this particular race but nevertheless they need to be managed. Of course, um, Getting out of the um, the channel, getting through the Sorrento Channel is um, something to be really wary of. Now, um, various boats, if you draw over sort of 2 metres, 2.5, there may actually be other alternative routes that you can take. But generally speaking, if you follow your markers and um, have a watch person at the front of the boat, you can navigate quite comfortably if you, if you draw um, beyond 2.5. So uh, the starting um, mark is at Portsea, which is a lot of fun because generally speaking, most people have done uh, Cock of the Bay the night before. It's uh, quite advisable to try and get in a pen where there's not party hardy people next door to you because that can be quite tiring if you've um, uh, been tossing and turning, listening to everyone else party all night and you're up for an early start. But it's a terrific start from Portsea. It's, um, it's a, an a imaginary line start off um, the... Um, off the uh, start boat and uh, a lot of fun and your friends and family can gather at Port Pier to um, to say goodbye, to see you off. Of course, um, the big no-no is to exit the heads and stay outside of the sea uh, channel clearing. Obviously, you've got big rocks here. They're quite notorious and um, you've got to navigate some shallow areas if you're, if you're coming through over here as well, particularly... Uh, north of this area here. <clears throat> We've, uh, we like to maintain a good relationship with the shipping channel and uh, all the tankers and the pilots so it's um, we really encourage everybody to um, have done uh, particularly the RIP tour. Uh, Robin Hewitt runs that. Brilliant, brilliant and uh, there's nothing better than uh, achieving lining all your your finger markers up so that you can navigate through the heads. It's, it's um, I think it's one of the highlights to be honest. And, of course, the finish line is at the start of the Mercy River there. Now, uh, this year, Noel May will actually be in a, a, a camper caravan over here and uh, Lynn Wilton, my good self, will be your race champion. So uh, another thing to remember when you're actually uh, finishing your race and uh, obviously you want to be getting your sails down and pack, stack and rack everything up is that your spirit of Tasmania does depart uh, in the morning and in the evening and it does occupy the majority of the river when she turns around. She docks and then she turns around. So if we give you a, a call that the uh, spirit is leaving, we really ask that you respectfully uh, turn around, head a little bit back out and uh, wait for clear passage on that one.
once again, we'd like to maintain good working relationships with um, all of the commercial vessels, including the Spirit of Taz. Now, typically, um, the race is 138 nautical miles. So as I said earlier, 19 to 24 hours, uh, starting at Portsea. Uh, it's not mandatory to do Cock of the Bay prior unless you want to be part of the Sovereign Series, which is Cock of the Bay, uh, Rudder Cup, and then Top of the Island when you... Um, arrive at Mercy. The, the following day there's a, a yacht race around the top of the island which is quite uh, quite a thrilling and challenging yacht race. Uh, it is an exciting race and Mercy put on the biggest party. We've actually got a, an outdoor tent, we've got a band, we've got a lot happening. They're actually hosting um, the national championships for um, uh, the, I can't remember the, the, the yachts that the that, uh, there this year but they're hosting um, a national championship and it's going to be party city there so there will actually be the prelude to that and unfortunately if you want to keep your boat at um, Mercy afterwards you'll have to get special permission and probably most likely st stay on a swing mooring that's probably the best we can do for you in years gone by it was quite possible to leave your boat there and ping on down to Hobart if you wanted to watch the be down part of the festivities down there so uh, perhaps give me a call um, and I can organise a swing mooring for you if you'd like to do that this year. So um, I guess what you have to consider on a race to Devonport is the wear and tear. It's uh, a lot longer duration than any of your obviously your um, bay races and uh, the loading on the boat is quite substantial. And one race to Devonport is the equivalent of half a season of bay racing, which gives you a really good indicator of the wear and tear on the boat, which is why we are quite pedantic about Cat 2, about safety, about doing audits. We're all about the whole mandatory um, part of sailing with the ORCV is safety, safety first. Now, generally speaking, our races, once we sort of hit, if we're uh, in, in rough seas and we're, the, the weather is looking really bad and the prediction's not good, we will actually make a call and we could even cancel the race. We're always putting safety first. But generally speaking, um, really around about 16 to 20 um, knots is generally what the race historically has run at. Um, you will obviously need more, more gear and there'll be more weight on the boat, so you have to sort of really consider. We, we, we really encourage the crew to come on with one bag maximum and it's always a telltale sign with uh, newbies that are sailing. They'll turn up with two big bags and you'll have to shake your head and say, no, 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 no. So it's always good to um, forewarn. Obviously, you need a multi-skilled uh, crew and um, there's always the, the risk. That there's a higher risk. And um, it's a totally different approach when you're going beyond the bay. We like to take the don't rush things, stay safe, and fatigue management. Uh, I like the sailing that, um, the saying that tired, hungry, cold sailors make bad decisions. So what we try and do at all times is um, keep the warmth up and make sure everyone's getting the shifts. It's a great time. I find it's a great time personally. When I'm not on deck, I try to get as much rest as possible. Um, not so much perhaps for the rudder cup, but generally when you're doing longer races, I, I hit the sack as soon as I can. So um, those managing those aspects is absolutely critical. So you've got your extended duration. There's a, a much higher degree of self-sufficiency is required because once you head beyond the Port Phillip heads, beyond the bay, uh, you are to some extent um, on your own. Obviously, you've got your trackers, which we'll talk more about. Uh, you've got EPIRBs for, and you've got your radio. And, and mobile phones will work um, for a reasonably good duration out of the heads. Uh, when you get to Mercy, it's uh, quite. It, you really have to almost be touching shore to get mobile reception. I find, but um, you'd be surprised how long you'll be able to get mobile reception leaving uh, the heads. So, with the last line there, everything has to be uh, work workable or repairable at sea. I leave with an extensive toolkit, uh, lots of different screws, lots of amp, uh, light bulbs. If you open up um, our little area where we keep our toolkit, I've got lots of containers with spare parts and they're all easily uh, identifiable by labelling. I like to think that I can be downstairs, um, lift the seat, grab a box pretty quickly and be upstairs in a matter of seconds if I have to. I guess 101 is that uh, rule one is the skipper's responsibility. 
and that is that um, the safety of the boat and the crew is the sole responsibility um, of the skipper. The boat has to be thoroughly seaworthy with an experienced crew, appropriately trained, and um, you must be able to satisfy that the boat has, um, you know, a well, the hull, the spares, the rigging, the sails, all of the gear is actually of sound um, nature and able to be used correctly. And, and, of course, you have to then mitigate all of your risks and look at various different things that can break on all of these parts, the hull, spares, rigging, every, your sails, all of your repair kits and all of your, your spare parts have to be really available on the boat so you can do quick repairs um, if need be. Um, I think we've all quite got experience at um, mending sails and replacing light bulbs and doing all sorts of things. So in summary, the equipment must be accessible, fit for purpose, function, serviced and checked. Uh, many hev heavy items must be permanently installed. Uh, all other heavy items must be secured fastly. And that, that goes for things like your, um, your sea anchors. They need to be, if they're, if they're in under the floor, they need to be harnessed so that if you lift them up as first port, you've actually got it harnessed in so that if the boat does tip upside down, you don't have anything skidooing, uh, which, of course, then it'll be on the roof. It'll be skidooing down on people below. So... Pardon me, it really is. Everything has to be considered and thought through, which is why we um, have our safety standards. So um, working through the requirements with CAT 5, you've obviously got your radio and communications, your structural requirements, your equipment safe stability. Um, crew training is essential. I, I still hear stories of people jumping on the boat for the first time and doing an ocean race and not even getting a safety um, tour of the boat, which just leaves me cold. That is so um, in contravention with everything the ORCV is about. So um, ideally we like a good percentage of your crew to have done our Triple SC training course. Ideally if you can have all of your crew do it, then uh, no man or woman will be left wondering if there's an emergency. And that's really the key to this whole um, crew training and getting their experiences happening. Now entries and paperwork, I guess that's the big bugbear for the office. It's the last thing that the boats and the, the, the it's the last thing that the crew tend to think of but we actually had a lengthy discussion last night and at the ORCV that one of the biggest stresses on us is actually paperwork not being right and, and we've actually received emails after boats have sailed changing things and it's so not on because if you're in an emergency and we're dealing with AMSA and we've got next of kin on the phone and we've got the documentation that's not right, it's not cool. So please consider your entries and your paperwork and any changes. If As soon as you know of a change, let us know, uh, as opposed to oh, at some point I'll let, them, let the ORCV know. So these things are really important so that we can run a really good race. We're all about safety, improving the sport, making it so that people um, have absolute lively confidence of jumping on a boat and doing any manner of ocean races. Now just quickly having a look at uh, personal equipment, uh, life jackets, harnesses, personal light, personal clothing, GPS capability and um, it's always important to do a man overboard. I know that on our yacht we, um, we run several man overboards but one of the things that we did do is we were, we just wanted those extra um, assistance capabilities of if anyone was in the water. So we had halyards lengthened as um, just that sort of something that we could hook onto someone. Even if we couldn't winch them up, we could at least have them connected to the boat. There's all sorts of things you can run through to um, do man overboard. And I tell you what, once you're trying to bring someone in that's been in the water, they can often be carrying... 35 kilos of water alone when you try to haul them back in it's really it, it's so as soon as you can get your man overboard done at, with your crew it's ideal and it's a it can be a really fun thing to do just going back to that slide again um the, i think the skipper's got enough to deal with getting the boat ready and all of the compliance but i guess it's really important that uh, there's a bit of outsourcing to people to make sure that they're accountable for their own gear and it's not a, once again, it's not a last minute rush. I always enjoy putting our medical kit together. It's quite surprising how quickly medication expires and it's um, it can be frustrating because you've paid 
a lot of money to get your medical kit up and running and uh, then you're going through and finding that um, things have expired. But um, I find uh, the, um, the pharmacy just near the yacht club down at Sandringham are very, very uh, yachty friendly. When I originally started doing the medical kit, I was actually going to my local doctor with the, the boat entry fee, the registration of the boat, and a whole lot of uh, paperwork to substantiate that we were doing an ocean race. And she actually wrote me out individual prescriptions and then went and had them filled. Uh, so I've, I've sort of got around that system now by um, either, well, she expects me what, every year, by the way, to, to rock up again with, and I usually bring my drugs with me and we go through what I need and what I need to replace and taking the kit. So I've actually built a lot of trust with her. But uh, the Sandringham Pharmacy near the Yacht Club is ideal. I can't actually remember the name off the top of my head, but I'm sure it's on the OICV website. But um, I also have three medical kits. I have one that I have taped up and I put a cross over the, the tape and they're the ones that have my hardcore drugs in it. And um, I let everyone know on the boat where it's stored, but I also, if the seal's broken um, without um, a, a, a use, then uh, that person doesn't get to, to sail with us ever again. So it's it, obviously it's got to be some really stringent rules around. And it's surprising, you never really know anyone um, you think you know people, but uh, you can always get a surprise along the way. So I have my hardcore kit, and then I have all my go-tos for seasickness, um, Panadols, um, heartburn medication, all of those sort of, I call that the grab bag, just the quick and easy. I shouldn't confuse it with a grab bag, but that's the, the go-to. And then I've got another soft bag, which is all of the uh, bandages, band-aids, um, a couple of just slight slings and things like that down the bottom of it. And I usually have a few things in the pockets, tucked in the pockets around the edges, which is your scissors to cut your bandages with and tape to if you need extra help with your, your tape. So I've got three of those. Let's talk about the quick medical grab bag. I do also have a grab um, medic medication in the grab bag. So, um, and it's always the challenge of having your medical kit race ready uh, packed away somewhere safe but but accessible in a case of an emergency. And once again, um, there's a propensity to only let the skipper and the key people know where the medical kit is, but you never know who's going to get hurt if there is a, a, an emergency. So that's something that you'll have to always work through. And I suggest you look at that when you're doing your man overboard drill as well. Stability is one of the key factors of your boat being able to enter an ORCV race. So if you look at the basic concepts, you've got your buoyancy with your boat, so the centre of buoyancy, and then you've got the centre of gravity, and then you've got the forces directly opposed when it's upright, and then you've got your centre of buoyancy which moves out as the boat heels. So if you actually look at your um, basic concepts, what we need the boat to be able to do is withstand, I mean, what breaks boats is waves mostly and of course if you if you're encountering rough seas we need to actually have the formula of being able understanding that your bite your boat can right itself when it's put under an angle of heel <clears throat> and you've got this inverted stability here so this is our axis and our tipping point so we just need to be able to be sure that your boat can withstand these types of waves and um, what we have to do is actually have a certificate of stability. So generally speaking, it costs around $300 to do your inclination test. Um, your RCT certificate's $250. Um, so pretty much you're, you're looking around about $800 to if you haven't got a stability certificate right now. Um, it's the full measurement, the creation of a new hull, it's a major exercise, so getting your stability sorted straight away is, is 101 of importance. Anyone who's got any concerns about stability, that's what we're all about. So once again, talk, talk to the OICV office and they'll direct you in the right direction. Okay, experience and training. So pretty much we want um, ideally as many of your crew having done our triple SC course. So 50% for CAT 2 and um, less than that for CAT 3. So you do need one licensed operator and one first aid person. Um, in terms of navigation, uh, there's a few question marks there. 
but generally speaking, um, you'll have somebody on board uh, that's responsible for navigation. And interestingly enough, um, you know, I've seen novices jump on a boat and pick it up incredibly quickly and other people that struggle. I think navigation's one of those things. That I think it's um, there's a, a learnt skill part of it, but there's also some people just have natural ability. So um, it's really good to hunt down that person that has the natural ability in your crew and train them up. So um, now reefing and sail changes in the dark is um, a whole new experience. It's um, quite intimidating being clipped on um, with just head torches on and um, doing a sail change. Now, those of you who do sail changes all the time will, in fact, um, be able to close your eyes and largely be able to do a sail change with your eyes closed. Well, that's actually ideal if you are out doing night sailing. Um, but I know myself there's certain things um, with the head sail that I could do um, blindfolded there's certain things with you know the, the the main I can do blindfolded and that's really the the confidence that you want we've actually been in a situation where we've sent someone up that wasn't familiar with sail changes strapped on at night and it's not pleasant it's not good it's so you would um, choose your people carefully for them and this is a very experienced sailor and enough helms um Depending on your race and your category, if you don't have a dispensation for auto helm, then it's something to consider. And one thing I've learned myself is that there's a lot of different sailing between 8 and um, 18 knots and there's another, you know, between 18 and 25 knots and then beyond that. So not only do you need enough helms, but you actually need people that can withstand various different weather conditions because someone who can helm easily up to 18 may not be able to do anything when it's um, up to 25. So that's an important thing to think about. I just realised I made an error early on in this slide as well. Um, ideally, we would like 50% of the crew having sailed Cat 2. Um, I realised I was talking about our um, safety and survival course when I was talking about that, but I think the slide's self-explanatory anyway. So the minimum is boat familiarisation, hands-on training, uh, good sail policies and what we were talking about earlier with the wind strengths and sail types. Uh, man overboard really is an essential thing before you leave the heads. Uh, get your navigation and radio operations um, in order. And uh, the other thing too is your engine and other mechanics. Um, for those of you who've had to bleed a, 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 an engine or um, change oil or filters, all sorts of things can go wrong when you're actually um, out and about. So having a good level of experience and one of the things too is understanding uh, if you need to get your fuel to your fuel tank, what uh, Phillips head number you need for that. If you need to um, change your filters or make sure that all you've got all your matching tools to do those jobs on board. And for those of you who do plenty of sailing, who hasn't had a lot of fun pulling toilets apart? Mm -mm. So, um, and once again, um, keeping a good toilet fully functioning on board is all about the right toilet paper and... Um, you know, in some boats like um, on our, our yacht, we try and skip toilet paper going down altogether. So we've got a, a, a procedure for toilet paper and how it's disposed of on the boat as opposed to flushing and uh, keep wet ones. Oh, my God, wet ones are the worst thing. Anyone who's a well-meaning person thinking that they're wiping their hands and saving water and then flushing the wet ones down the toilet isn't doing anybody any favour. So these are all the small things that can go unnoticed and really cause you a, a great amount of grief later. Okay, so I think we're uh, probably doubling up a little bit here, but uh, man overboard, your reef sails and changes in the dark, make sure you've got enough helms. Uh, storage and use of gear and emergency steering. Now that's another key thing. Make sure everyone knows where the emergency steering is. Um, a couple of great stories recently of um, uh, a couple of friends of mine on a boat and uh, the steering went and one looked at the other and they, and, uh, they sort of said, okay, well, this, is, this isn't good and they sort of spoke without words, if you know what I mean, and um, by the time that they'd really concluded that they were in trouble, the the, uh, the co the friend had been downstairs, had the emergency steering up, and it was locked on and locked and loaded within probably two minutes, and they lost very little steerage, and they were able to finish the race. So they're the sort of things that you want to sort of be onto things really quickly and have your backup plan rehearsed really well. 
Um, and there's nothing worse than when you're in a stress situation, particularly people who are new to sailing and ocean sailing, different things are called different names. We all struggle with this, like how many names is there for a head sail, for example. But to have people in a panic situation be able to identify that it's an emergency steering that we want and know that, that exactly where that is, it's under a bunk or it's under the table or it's wherever you've got it stowed, be able to identify what's required and where it is straight away, that's, that's gold on a boat. I also, um, with navigation, I always like to take paper charts as well and um, it's quite interesting. It's, it's, um, can be, it can really make the trip for a lot of people because some people just love to be on their, their, their IT, their iPads and, and pressing buttons and doing formulas. Um, I did a delivery up to, um, to Ellie Beach and I mapped it all on maps all the way and there's parts of that that I'll never forget and it was, it was, um, it's a bit of an art actually, and a, a bit of a joy as well. So don't hesitate to have your, your backup um, plan there as well. Oh yes, getting good advice. So once again, con um, construction of the boat and stability, just refer all matters back to the ORCV if you're in the least bit concerned. Um, support with technology is available. Um, advice on the most simple sort of solutions, we've just had a, a rig taken down by ORCV volunteers of a, um, a, a, a skipper who's actually not in the state at the moment but wanting to do um, the race at Christmas. And so amazingly, all these people just came out of the woodwork, took the rig down, pack stacked and racked and it's on its way to be, re to re be replaced now. So um, there's so much help at hand and so many willing people if you need uh, things and there's nothing, you know, nothing worse than a skipper that almost exhausts themselves getting their cat to, getting their compliance, getting their boat up and running, and getting everything on the boat. And then you go, it's race day, and I'm I'm tired. So they're the sort of things that we really want to avoid happening. And um, crewing's obviously um, a tricky matter, uh, particularly when there's parties. And at the other end, uh, there's a a, a conduct. Um, a, a behaviour conduct as well. In fact, the ORCV is um, going to be spending a little bit more time talking about um, conduct over the line once you finish the, the finish line. And um, you know, at the end of the day, we don't want the skipper to be responsible for drunk and disorderly behaviour. So it's really a matter of everyone towing the line and being sensible and responsible. And I guess skippers, you work out who you want to have on your crew next time once you've finished the you know, it's not just about their ability on boat, it's how they ha handle themselves through the entire um, race and the return as well. So any advice you need on crew, please don't hesitate. And finding specialist trades, we uh, would like to think that we can point you in uh, the direction of most issues that you'll have. If in doubt, just ring the office. Okay, you need to prepare your own plan for the lead up and the race itself. Uh, promote your program and lock in your crew. Um, the good thing about a race like um, Devonport is a lot of a lot of crews seek it out because it is a nice early entry race, and start working through your list. Focus on your stability, construction, certif and certificate first, and your race. Um, then your race will come a lot easier after that, and you'll have peace of mind as well. Work out your chain of command: who's going to be your second, who's going to do the watch, who's doing to the leads, and these are lovely things that you can actually carry right through the boat. Like number your crew. And then above your coffee station, have all the people's numbers with, you know, how much sugar and milk they take in their coffee and whether they drink tea and all those things that you might be able to hand them if they're up on uh, watch and it's cold and dark and raining and no one's having much fun. It's great to have these things organised. Likewise, your little bags for um, sunscreen, uh, sunglasses, hats and caps. We like to have little bags with everyone strung around and once again have their numbers on it and that way you know, a person who's number one uh, stays number one through the whole of the journey. And key in your, your spine of the boat, you know, get your helm organised, your main, your trimmers, your pit, your mast, your bow. So it, particularly in an emergency situation, everyone knows where muster is and that's, that's key too. And, of course, your supporting roles. Who's going to do your cooking, your navigation, your radio, your first aid, and, of course, you, whoever gets least seasick is the person who's best downstairs preparing meals and things like that. And, um, and I know also that um, in the past we've had um, our little stainless, our little um, takeaway um, aluminium 
um, takeaway containers and people sort of cook six meals and we all share each other's meals and obviously you know if you're gluten intolerant or you've got um, you know vegan vegetarian issues that has to be catered for but a good collaborative and cooperative spirit around uh, food I find it better when people can actually bring food in in similar size containers because you can stack them in the fridge there's nothing worse when people just dump a great big bag of food and say oh here's my apples orange bananas blah, 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 and uh, here's all my drinks and they expect it all to go in the fridge so managing fridge space is really important as well and um, perhaps not so much for Devonport but certainly for a longer yacht race so work out who is least seasick um, organize with the crew in advance food and it's particularly good too because the week before the race if you're cooking you can add an extra and pop it in your little aluminium and then pop it in the freezer and it goes from the freezer to the boat to the oven which is ideal we're really lucky with the uh, Rudder Cup. It's um, It's got a fabulous name and we've had great sponsors over the years and we've just, I'm um, so proud to say that uh, um, we've also, uh, Geoconda Coffee has just come on board as a major sponsor. So um, I'll actually be updating the sponsorship page very soon. But if you're interested and you want to give back to the sport, we're always looking for um, donations of uh, money, food, any type of um, donation that's available. You know, it's one of those sports where um, it's, um, it's, it all gets back to us all putting in to get to get out, if you know what I mean. And, look, the finish line is amazing. Mercy is so good. Um, I'll just flip back to this slide here. This little pack was available last year and it's going to be again this year. It's called Taste of Tasmania and it's just filled with all sorts of beautiful cheeses, um, honey, um, fresh uh, berries, of course, berry season is absolutely going nuts over there at this time of year. And uh, national pies um, and pasties for the vegetarian option. It's just amazing. So we've been very fortunate with our sponsors. And so when you arrive, you get a hot pie, you get a, um, a taste of Tasmania pack so you can sit on your boat and, 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 a, and a box of beer. So sit on your boat and unwind and then get organised for your showers and uh, come up and uh, enjoy some fun at the bar. We've gone to a lot of trouble. Uh, the Mercy Yacht Club have um, been given a grant to repair a whole lot of their um, issues from the flood. So um, they've upgraded the showers. They've got new more, more uh, toilets on board. They've got a new um, IT system to help run the race. Amazing. They've done. They've worked so hard. They're such a small yacht club, and they're so big on the welcome. So um, that's the end of the slide. I hope it's been of some interest to you or some help. Um, look forward to seeing you at the finish. As I said earlier in the slide, Prezo, it is one of those can-do races. It's an er it's a wonderful early entry if you've just done your triple SC and you're getting your boat organised and you've got a good crew and you've got the key positions. Um, organized it's uh, a great prelude to do the rudder cup and then you can move on to the uh, to the west coaster and then you can move on and um, you know do a, a Sydney to Hobart so it's one of those brilliant training ground races um, thanks for listening a uh, good 33 minutes I really appreciate your time call the office if in doubt of anything thank you so much